Living in Martian Mushrooms, an alternative building material for space habitats, written and read by Rod Pyle. When crews eventually become permanent fixtures on the Moon and Mars, shelter will be a critical component of their existence. Once there is more than a handful of long-term dwellers, it will no longer be economically advantageous to transport habitation modules or even the raw materials to build them from Earth. Early on, repurposed SpaceX Starships could possibly provide some living space, but Mr. Musk has made it clear that most will be expected to return to Earth for reuse. What resources will provide the ready expansion of pressurized living space on the Red Planet? Well, one answer may surprise you. For years, Dr. Lynn Rothschild of NASA's Ames Research Center has been exploring a unique solution to low-mass building materials, fungus. It's cheap, easy to transport, and self-replicating under the right conditions, including, she thinks, on the Moon and Mars. And it's all based on synthetic biology. For centuries, people did descriptive chemistry, Rothschild begins, citing the centuries-long period of observing chemical processes. Then, about 150 or 200 years ago, we started making new things, calling this synthetic chemistry. She believes we now have made a similar step in the biological sciences called synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is making something new with biology, instead of simply observing, she says, whether it's altering a current organism or trying to make a new organism from scratch. With a doctorate in cell and molecular biology, Rothschild is uniquely qualified to push the boundaries of this relatively new branch of science, in this case, forcing fungus to grow into practical forms for use as a building material. Now, before you start scratching your head over this, thinking fungal habitats? Are they serious? Know that Rothschild has won a number of grants from NASA's NIAC program, the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts program. And NIAC is NASA's version of DARPA, looking to advance technologies that can be considered decades away, and these grants are incredibly competitive. As Agency Administrator Bill Nelson has put it, NASA's space technology team and the NIAC program unlock visionary ideas, ideas that make the impossible possible. This new research is a stepping stone to our Artemis campaign as we prepare to go back to the moon to live, to learn, to invent, to create, and then to venture to Mars and beyond. To date, Rothschild has won eight of these grants. I had five Phase 1s, two Phase 2s, and one Phase 3, and the running joke is that makes me the queen of the NIAC grants, Rothschild laughs. Incidentally, Phase 3 is very hard to achieve. They've only given a few Phase 3s, maybe one per year, she adds. That's impressive, and it demonstrates both the uniqueness and the potential of this concept. At the core of this is the need for habitats in other worlds. As NASA gears up for human occupation on the Moon and Mars, they realize they need to think beyond large metal cans or habitats. Mass is always at a premium on rockets, and while modular metal pressure vessels work fine for the International Space Station, they were quite expensive to launch. Anytime you can kick some of the mass requirements to the far end of the project, in this case to the destination, that's a huge plus. Of course, both the Moon and Mars are rife with basic building materials like rocks and sand, but it could take a long time to find the right rocks that will fit together to stack into a structure. Just ask the ancient Mayans. And making concrete from regolith can be water and chemical intensive. Other methodologies are being investigated, including high temperature sintering of these raw materials. But Rothschild's concept sidesteps many complications and, best of all, it grows. The field of researching fungal structures is called mycotecture, and NASA has heralded it as a new multi-use material for in-space construction, reducing mass and saving resources for actual mission priorities. In the NIAC-funded project, Rothschild's team created multiple forms of fungi called biocomposites, defined as a material made from a combination of two or more distinct materials, at least one of which is naturally derived to create a new material with improved properties. From these, they fabricated small prototypes, testing some of them in a chamber that simulated the Martian environment. This all started when the center director at the NASA Ames Research Center learned about synthetic biology and told Rothschild that he thought this could be a big part of their future research. He felt that this was going to be the future, particularly as an enabling technology for getting humans off-planet, and I happen to have a PhD in cell and molecular biology, so he directed me to start a program in synthetic biology for NASA, and so it was off to the races, she recalls. Eventually, this assignment brought her to the notion of fungus-based structures. When you look at a mushroom, you're just looking at the fruiting body of a large group of what we call filamentous fungi, ones that have filaments, she says. Of course, we're all familiar with mushrooms. They taste great in a salad, but the filaments behind them may be more mysterious. 
The main part of the fungus, filaments called the mycelium, are really good at binding. She notes a student of hers had heard of a company called Evocative who were leaders in the field and who used fungus and wood chips to make packing material and other products. That student then used the technology to create the body of a biodegradable drone from the same materials. I was somewhat oblivious to what he was doing, she chuckles, but that project went viral, which was an interesting lesson in the power of the media. She got a call the next day asking what this was all about, and that led to an intuitive leap. If one could make the body of a drone, maybe you could use the same approach to make a habitat off-planet. Using something light like mycelium that could be dry and dormant during flight so that even just the weight of the water is eliminated made a lot of sense. So much of a rocket's fuel goes to just getting us off planet, she says. So anytime you can shave ounces, grams, kilograms off the payload, you've increased your mission capability. And while steel is very reliable, it's also heavy and the weight problems are going to compromise your mission. Steel is also rigid and, unlike mycelium, needs to be fabricated prior to launch. If you put a prefab steel house on a building site, she says, you better have had the excavators there and everything else to prepare the site. But then if there's a crater there, you can't really conform the prefab structure to the building site, she adds. One of the beauties of a fungal structure grown on site is that as it grows, it conforms perfectly to the environment, negating the complications of trying to smooth rough terrain and eliminating, at least to a degree, the need for heavy equipment to do so. There are also other advantages. Psychologically speaking, steel structures are probably not the best environment for human beings over the long term. I don't know about you, but I don't really want to live in a stainless steel house, she adds. Fungus is also a vastly superior acoustic environment. Do you remember the last time you ate in a trendy all-glass-and-steel restaurant with a concrete floor? Chances are you had to strain to hear yourself and your partner over the din created by sound bouncing off all those hard surfaces. And here, fungal structures win as well. Fungal mycelia is also very good acoustically, Rothschild says, and the material rates highly in safety as well. It's also very low flammability. Finally, with water weighing over 8 pounds or 3.8 kilograms per gallon, a dry, dormant building material that bulks up at the destination is highly desirable, especially if water can be found there, as appears to be the case with both the Moon and Mars. Think of the compressed sponge toys you had as a child that expanded into full-size playthings. Many times their dry size and weight when rehydrated. And better still, fungus continues to grow when wet. The design for these habitats is quite clever, and the Rothschild equates the general idea with a just-add-water child's bouncy house. You start with an inflatable that incorporates the seeded fungal mycelium, she says, maybe with some dehydrated wood chips, and then you send it off planet. Once it arrives at its destination, you let it inflate with a little oxygen. She notes that not much gas would be required when operating in the lunar vacuum or near vacuum on Mars. Then, you just add a little water and presto, it grows to bind with added inert materials such as dehydrated wood chips or possibly aerogel, and in short order, you have a home, or more. You are literally growing your habitat on site, she notes, and once you buy into that vision, you realize you could also grow tables and chairs and beds or even rover shells. It's really almost anything. It boggles the mind just how flexible this vision is, she adds. But as handy as that would be, more is required to make a shell into a domicile. Now, I can't just blow this thing up and tell people to live in it, she notes. The NIAC program pushed us. What are you going to do in terms of heat? What are you going to do for plumbing? There are a lot of elements that go into a dwelling. At that point, she met Chris Maurer, the principal architect at Red House Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. By sheer serendipity, Chris was starting to look at the idea of using fungi to build houses on Earth, she says. I told him I had this crazy idea about using fungi to build habitats off-planet. He looked at me and said, I had the same crazy idea, so we decided to work together. With Myra's architectural experience, what was a one-off experiment in mycelium structures took on a whole new level of complexity and promise. Now, every new field needs a name to be noticed, and they had just the one. Mycology is the technical word for the study of fungi, so we took myco, the term for fungi, and texture, which refers to architecture, and came up with the word mycotexture, she says. As simple as it all sounds, however, they realized that the material would need to be hardy enough for long-term habitation and protection from the harsh environments off-world. Fortunately, fungus is what they call a tunable material. Would you just grow fungal mycelia or something like sawdust, she says, you end up with something that looks and kind of feels like you'd left a piece of whole wheat bread out on the counter for three weeks. A dry, lightweight, brownish thing, and you think, I'm not going to build anything out of that. 
So it depends on both the binding material as well as the post-processing. We've been able to get fungal mycelium to bind sand and with a little nutrient added with lunar regolith simulant and Martian regolith simulant. This way you're getting something much harder and more durable, Rothschild explains. Incidentally, this technology has ready applications on Earth. It's easy to see how fungus can be used in extreme environments, the earthly equivalent of Mars, if you will, for housing. But there are more immediate applications. In 2018, another team of mine was looking at my off-planet applications and realized that you can really tune the materials as desired for use on this planet, she notes. A company in Alaska has experimented with making a foam out of fungal mycelia to use as a substitute for styrofoam to ship frozen fish. Uses can range from a styrofoam substitute, she notes, all the way up to a very hard building material that you would think are pieces of particle board or even harder. The possibilities appear to be vast. Now, when you start talking about habitats made from fungus, a natural reaction is concern. We've all been taught that it's not something we want in our homes. But fear not. The fungus that we've been primarily using is the same one that reishi is derived from, she notes, so it's a common one. In fact, people can eat it. Reishi has been used in Asia for centuries to enhance the immune system, treat pulmonary diseases, and more recently, even in experimental cancer treatments. And, as noted, it's edible, a potential partial solution for dietary needs if grown separately. Of course, with any biological material, planetary protection is a concern. NASA has, over the years, instituted increasingly stringent protocols to keep its spacecraft clean. The gold standard was set by the Viking Mars landers, which were scrubbed clean with harsh solvents over and over, and baked at over 250 degrees Fahrenheit, or 120 degrees Celsius, for three days to sterilize them, a temperature that's tough on both modern electronics and anything biological. Over time, these protocols have become a bit less demanding, with work continuing to assure that future missions don't contaminate the environments upon which they land and operate. Because of the planetary protection protocols, we do need to be extra careful, Rothschild responds. If there turns out to be indigenous life on Mars and we destroyed it before we had a chance to discover it, that would be one of the greatest biological tragedies ever. We would have destroyed the chance to answer the great question, are we alone? So we can't just go release things on the surface of Mars, she notes. However, once we have humans on Mars, human life is going to obviously be a very high priority, she adds. You can't say, well, let the six astronauts die because there might be life on the other side of the planet. So it's important to have a balance regarding absolute planetary protection. That's why it's so important to have these robotic precursor missions prior to having humans on Mars, she says. They will tell us ultimately what needs to be done to preserve the Martian environment. With regard to the moon, she adds, the moon is a totally different situation. It's dead and is likely to have been dead forever, so we don't have planetary protection protocols in place for the moon. That makes it a great place for us to test these technologies. So how can we best progress this unique technology for practical use in space? We've started working with one of the NASA seed-funded commercial space stations called Starlab, she says, which is interested in using this approach for paneling inside their space station as well as for the beds, tables, and so on. We're also working towards trying to get onto a mission where we show that this can work on the moon, and I would love to get an experiment on the surface of Mars. That will, of course, require a very competitive proposal, but I'm determined that that is going to be the mic drop of my career. It's all very exciting, and I can't wait to see what comes of it. This article was sourced from an interview with Dr. Rothschild for the This Week in Space podcast, co-hosted by Rod Pyle and Tarek Malik, Editor-in-Chief of Space.com. You can find the podcast on all major providers or by visiting twit.tv on the web.